This is Wilson Morales from Black Feminine TV talking to director Mo McCray on his feature, A Lot of Nothing, that will be premiering at the South by Southwest Film Festival. What's going on, Mo? Wilson, what's up, man? How you doing? Good. So, you know, I've known your work as an actor for years. Now you're making this transition to directing. So how did this come about and put in this project together? Well, first of all, before we talk about that, first thing I want to do is acknowledge you, Wilson, and all your coverage and dedication to a lot of really incredible talents, artists, actors, directors, filmmakers that don't often get acknowledged by a lot of people in the media. I want to thank you for that, first and foremost, because as I think about my career as an actor and the nascent stages of it, you were one of those people you may have been one of the first people to ever publish my picture on anything or just to take that time to talk to me back when it was like on Facebook post uh -huh. about me being somewhere in support of one of my friends probably at that time. So I want to thank you for that, your commitment and dedication in this manner. It means a lot. So I was actually really excited to have this conversation with you because of that and seeing you support so many of my, me and my peers throughout the years. So thank you. So yeah, so yeah. then... You got this movie coming up. Everybody is excited to see it. It's one of the few films that's in the narrative competition. You know, you got some names in the film that we are familiar with. So go mm -hmm. ahead. How did it come about? So this whole film came about because, um, you know, several years ago, I kind of had this idea, the inkling of an idea, some themes and things I wanted to address. And I made a short film first that I self-financed and I was very fortunate enough to have like a dear friend and a big brother to me, Makai Pfeiffer, agree to be in my short film and Parisa Fitzhenley, who's an incredible actress. So I made a short film first, like in 2018. And then I took it to my reps and my whole team and they saw it and said, this needs to be a feature. So then I spent the rest of the time writing it and then trying to get it financed and set up. But um, ultimately ended up getting all those resources together and was able to cast Alain Noel, Cleopatra Coleman, Justin Hartley, Shamir Anderson, and Lex Scott Davis. And you had the Dreamcast, it were the perfect people to tell this story. The story itself is about this uh, upper middle class married couple who seemingly has everything figured out and they're doing very well. And watching the news one night, they discover their next door neighbor committed what they believe to be a crime an abuse of power and they decide to confront this neighbor and things spiral out of control <laughs> it becomes a bit of a comedy of errors as they try to take actions and for part of that it was like this whole exploration of how we get so wound up when things happen in the world and we want to do something but oftentimes it amounts to a lot of nothing so this was an exploration of like what happens if we actually try to uh, seek justice or retribution to take matters into our own hands while still dealing with our own personal issues and inner conflicts. You know, it's a, it's a heavy subject and, and you don't know how it's going to play out. You know, times are changing. So, you know, whenever you think about it to now, who knows what's happened in the world that can we put this out? Is there an audience for this? You know, what's what I'm writing? Does it still resonate today? Because every day things change, you know, right. and when you see when you put this together and then obviously, you know, we're still getting these sort of crimes out there. You know, uh, we watch the news every day and whether it's uh, this situation or that situation, you have an emotion when you're watching the news of any sort, you know, and you want to do something. So uh, in terms of exploring that, besides what you were thinking, was there anything else that served as an inspiration? Was it people you knew, people you talked to, or just the, the news in general? Well, I was definitely each, so it's like five main characters in a film and each one of those characters is inspired by myself or a person that I've intimately known. And so that was inspiration for the actual characters and the inciting incident for the idea, I believe happened around the murder of Trayvon Martin, where everyone, we were so upset and people wanted to do something. So I did, that's when I kind of began to get really fascinated with the idea of what would it look like if the average person tried to do something? And then I was also fascinated with love and relationships. So at the center of this, you know, there's this married couple, then there's another couple that's involved, and then there's a, a person who recently divorced. So you see how our own like personal micro issues 
ram against the macro problems in the world and what happens in that collision. And that's something I feel like is timely. It'll always be timely because it's always something that we're dealing with and navigating as people. <clears throat> now, we don't want to talk so much about the film because we want we don't want to give it away. You know, obviously, yeah, right. it's going to play at the festival and then we, let's hope it gets picked up. And then obviously, a lot more people can see it. So we don't want to talk so much about the, what, the going on in the film. Obviously, as an actor trying to make his first film, you know, there's always people we always get like, OK, is this going to be a one and done? You know, you get actors making a film and then what's the next step? Are they making that transition? You know, uh, Ben Affleck tried it. And he's done it successfully with three or four films. And so now for you, is this the way you're doing or are you going to still keep your day job and act? <laughs> I will be a filmmaker for the rest of my life. OK, that is my heart as an artist like there's no way this is gonna be the last film like i immediately made uh something else i just made this project that's on hulu right now star Keisha, that i wrote produced and directed i have a few other things in development i'm really passionate about like i love acting but i also love photography i love filmmaking directing like i'm going to be committed to doing it all as long as i have breath in these lungs i want to do it all no review, but the cinematography in this movie was great. It looked really, really good, you know. And for a first-time filmmaker, sometimes, you know, you want to get everything on point, you know, because I've seen films where great story, uh, uh, production design is not that great. Production design is great, not a good film, you know. So it's not easy to get everything for all cylinders to work out and obviously time will tell you know once you premiere at the, at the festival you'll see what people think of it uh but nevertheless you got the project done you got that the albatross off your back as far as can i get it done because i think when you're making a film there's the idea then there's the casting then there's the money then there's the money for the editing you know then there's the right, money for right. the marketing people don't understand how much goes into it um you know, in terms of trying to get an awareness to what you've created. And so uh, with the cast that you have, uh, was it easy to convince? And although, uh, you know, I always wonder, like, everybody has friends. But at the same time, friends have managers and agents when they're in this business. It's right, like, right, right, right. <laughs> you know, right. like, I want to do it, but my people are telling me it's not, now's not the right time. I got this going, that going. And so uh, was it a challenge getting the cast together or did they do it out of love and, okay, I believe what you're doing, I believe in the script? Well, that's a great question. Well, so in terms of like, well, first of all, going back to the cinematography, before we talk about cash, you mentioned the cinematography of the film. And I'm going to highlight my cinematographer, John Rosario. And actually, I ended up having two cinematographers, John Kang and John Rosario, as a result of COVID. We got shut down for 15 months. So the first portion of the movie wow. was done. The first portion of the schedule, not necessarily the chronological order of the film, but the first portion of the schedule was done by John Kang. And then I had John Rosario, who I finished it out with. And then I just did the last project with. And those guys were blessings because I'm a very visual person. And I think the assumption for a lot of people when they read the script is that it was going to be very straightforward, straight down the middle because of the subject matter. But for me, the movie's intentionally absurd, it's funny, it's grounded, it's a thriller, and it's art. For me, it's just an art installation of a film. And so the cinematography was a huge part of me being able to communicate that. So being able to have like my, my background as a photographer, my background with the love for really visual filmmakers, coupled with cinematographers that had the skill set to actually execute it, that was like a, that was pretty much like one of the biggest things, and then having Jill Bogdanowicz color the film, who I believe is the best colorist in the entire industry, being fortunate enough to have people like that. I'm happy that you commented on the cinematography because that was a huge focus in the storytelling. Because if you see something that's um, just lush and textured, it, it lends itself to creating a more immersive experience for the audience. And it's just beautiful aesthetically. You like to see like tragic moments but photographed beautifully. That's some of the greatest stuff in cinema has been done that way. So that's the piece about the cinematography. In terms of the cast, the casting process was very interesting. And as a first time filmmaker, I had, you know, it was a lot of lessons to be learned throughout the casting process. One of the most nervous points in my life, honestly, was the day that the script 
was going to go to all the agencies. We had an incredible uh, casting director, Leslie Wu, who was just coming off with a farewell at the time, which was winning all these awards. We met with several casting directors, but she was the most passionate. She read it and was like, I have to be involved with this movie and with your vision, your special. Let's go. And so I went with passion. I went with skill. And she sent it out to all the agencies. And I'll never forget thinking like, okay, this is the moment where the town can potentially say, who the do you think you are? What is this? Because it's a very ambitious script with really tricky tone. And luckily it was a lot of really incredible responses. People that I admire deeply and that I am truly a fan of actually came in and auditioned for the film and like or expressed interest and people wanted to meet and it was quite a process of going through and meeting different people and reading everyone. Um, but each role found the perfect actor. Every, everyone had a different process. I did have a personal relationship with a couple of people, but they still like read just to make sure that it felt right. And they were committed to the script, the script and I sold them on a vision. So I didn't have to like ask for a favor. I think everybody did it with a mutual understanding of like how, um, what the reciprocity of value could be in the process, which is really an honor for me as a first time writer, director, producer. When you wear this many hats, that's, that could come up with a lot of challenges in trying to put this together, you know, and you've been on set at sets as an actor for years. So when you're playing and wearing this many hats, how do you overcome the challenges? You know, because nothing's ever perfect. Nothing ever goes no. easily. <laughs> you know, so like, you know, like I say, you're the actor, you're the director, you're the producer, you know, it's so like in other roles, you know, like how do you stay sane? <laughs> I think the key to that was having a great team. So like my producing partner that was with me from the time it was a short film, Any Clemens, he was able to facilitate a lot of things that allowed me to kind of wear one hat at a time. So it's like, while I was a director, I didn't think about being a writer anymore. I thought as a director, I had to honor my director role. And the same thing with producing a lot of producing duties while I was directing, Eni Clemens, Jason Tomasco, Zach Christofek, they were like my on the ground guys. And then our associate producers, Matt Cassaro and Eric Hover, they helped them, which allowed me. So to answer your question is short, it's really about having a team that can support and facilitate those things and allow my focus to be whatever it needs to be in any given moment. Mm -hmm. And then what did you learn in the process, you know, when you're Director, is there anything technical you learned in terms of how to shoot, stop, you know, edit, you know, as you go on to your next project? You've already done a short. Now you've done a feature length. You know, obviously you're going to continue to do this. Will you say to yourself, next time I'm going to do this, next time I'm going to do that? Is there anything in particular? And this is before the audience sees it. So what did you pick up, you know? <laughs> Next time I'm going to have a post-production supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> so pre-production, production, post-production post are all very different animals. And there are a lot of pitfalls at every stage of the process of making a film. And I, my naivete I often say is my greatest asset because I'm not often aware of all the pitfalls. I tend to focus on what I can do and not the things that are going to potentially be a problem. So when it came time for post-production, when all the money is spent, things are tight, and it's like, okay, my producers and I, we'll just facilitate talking to the editor and the color house and sound design, and then you have to transfer all these files, and post-production gets super technical, VFX and all those things. So my biggest takeaway was really think about, and this is something that could be applicable for life, I think, is really thinking about the way you want to finish in the beginning and setting up for that and putting those things in place at the end of the day you know uh now that you are making this transition to behind the scene um what kind of films do you want to create you know i, I always wonder like whether or not black directors want to make black films or black directors want to make films that like okay whether it caters to a certain audience or not you know or certain genres or not you know is there certain focus that you want to do as opposed, you know, as opposed to just making films to what pleases you, or what you think is right. I want to tell the most dynamic stories possible, whether that's a 
predominantly black cast, predominantly white cast, Latina X, Latin Latin X cast. It, it, those things aren't as important to me, honestly, as being able to just tell great stories that wide audiences can connect to and people can find humanity in no matter where they're from. Because I think all those things are very divisive and I don't want to be like relegated to one specific thing. My goal as a filmmaker is just to tell dynamic stories. Like the next movie I want to make is extremely different than a lot of nothing. It may potentially be set in like the desert in the 80s and it might be a predominantly white cast and then it's like that. But it's the themes, it's the humanity. It's like, how much can I um, push the boundaries of a genre to where it no longer begins to fit within a genre? Because that's what I try to do with a lot of nothing. And I feel like I want that to kind of be like a stamp of my work where you could go into a film that, you could go into a Mo Cray film, laugh, cry, be upset, have questions, find answers, and then have to have a conversation when it's over. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm gonna do as a filmmaker. Before that, we, we're you know we're still gonna see you on a big and small screen. What do you got coming up next that we're gonna see you in? Uh, next, uh, I believe, is the flight attendant on HBO Max. Uh, season six, two, season yeah, season two for the flight attendant. Once again, that's a show I was excited to join because they do the thing where it's heavy subject matter, but dealt with in a way that allows you to laugh at the characters and at yourself and there's intrigue and my character is really cool. I have a film that I starred in and executive produced called MVP that we're still looking for distribution on that. So hopefully that's coming out soon and then kind of just figuring it out from there. But those are the next two things in the pipeline. You, that already you, didn't, I, you didn't tell me what I want to hear. That is, are you going to appear in Den of Thieves, the sequel? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. See that, that thing. For all talks I've had, uh, this would be a, a spoiler alert here, maybe, but every conversation I've had with Christian Gutegas, the director, in the event there's a Den of Thieves 2, my character Gus will be there, rough and tumble, like in the first one. And I, and I got to say, that film, we all has such a brotherhood in that movie, making that film together. It's really one of the highlights of my career as an actor. Like we we all still like on a group chat roasting each other and stuff to this day and sharing. Hey, crazy people love that film. People want to see it. It's kind of funny. I'm in New York, and so at this time right now, his dad is on TV. Eric Braden, who was in the movie, oh, right, <laughs> you right, know, right, right. you know. So it's a small world in that, you know. So people always love sequels, you know, uh, especially when uh, they liked it. It's not, and then you know, it was not about how much you made at the box office. It's like if people remember your film. That, at the end of the day, as an actor, as a filmmaker. You want people to remember your film. That's all you want out of it. Because right. there's so many projects out there nowadays, whether it's TV, in theaters, or streaming, um, you want to be able to people to know your film as a black filmmaker as opposed to like, oh, okay, let me check it out. So, as opposed to, I heard about it. I saw it. You know, and That's what you want people to know is that they saw your project and, and then it got noticed. You know, It got right. noticed. And they liked it. And they enjoyed it. Like, yeah. That's one of those films. I have, I've had a career, I've had a very interesting career as an actor where I feel like, you know, I've been very fortunate to have been a part of some really great projects that did resonate with people, but didn't necessarily become like blockbuster smash hits or shows that on television shows that like, you know, had a season, didn't have huge ratings, but the people that watched the show loved the show. And then at these, one of those things, like you say, like we, I think we did decent at the box office, but the people on the street that stopped me to talk about that movie in particular, they love it. It's a classic for a lot of people. So I'm, I'm very proud to have been a part of that film. <clears throat> and before I let you go, obviously we're talking about a lot of nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes out to South by Southwest Westful, what's a good reason for people to see it? What's a good reason for it to be picked up? A good reason to see the film is it's unlike anything you've ever seen before. And you are going to experience all the things you hope to experience when you watch a film. Like that, I guarantee. All the things you hope to experience, you will experience. And the reason it should be picked up is because anybody that doesn't pick it up is going to look like an idiot for missing an opportunity to touch an audience with something like this. Like audiences are going to love it. Okay. We are good to go. I appreciate it. Thanks for talking to me. Obviously, it's, I'm always there to support. Big or small role, project or no project, whatever you got going, we're there to support.
I appreciate you so much, brother. Thank you. All right. And we are off the record. 